You may be seated. Let's open the Gospel of Matthew, and we will look this morning at chapter 26, and we'll continue at verse 57, reading on through 68 this morning. So Matthew chapter 26, verses 57 through uh, 68. First, let's go to our God and ask for his guidance. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you that we have this word that has power to crush stony hearts and provide new hearts of flesh that are living, active, ready to respond to your word and command. And Father, we pray this morning that as we read the text that we would um, make faithful application, that we would interpret it rightly so that you would be pleased and so that your people would be edified. And we pray this now by faith in the name of Jesus who stands for us, amen. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us. If you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say. Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? Thus far, the reading of God's word, may he add his blessing to it, and we say, Amen. You know, courtroom scenes often draw a lot of attention. Um, They have for all history, but today we see it all over the place in in popular media. People are often interested in seeing how a case will play out. Uh, What will be the verdict? Observing the judge, the witnesses, the accusations, the cross-examinations, all of these these things have caught people's attention. People are engaged in this. They like to to watch this kind of thing. Uh, People are interested in seeing how the justice system... If it will work, how will things unfold? There are movies that have become classics where the drama in the court scene is the high point, like a film, um, A Few Good Men, or maybe you remember Miracle on 34th Street, or a classic To Kill a Mockingbird, or maybe My Cousin Vinny, 
these and many other films. Uh, people love this stuff. You know, there's something about the truth being found out that moves people. And now you have all these other reality shows uh, like Judge Judy um, and others like The Hot Bench or Divorce Court, uh, these um, seasons uh, that people binge watch. People are interested in watching these kinds of things. What, what will unfold? They like to form their own opinions. Uh, or maybe they're won over by the questions being asked by some skilled attorney uh, who, when he or she gets the chance, wins the favor of the jury and wins the case. Asking the right questions. You know, that's really uh, that high point in that film whenever the person gets up in front of um, the cross-examination. Asking the right question or the right questions is the key to discovering truth. Um, so, in our text today, um, let's write this down here for help, for help for some, for an outline here. A corrupt trial. Now, on a more serious note, uh, more serious than Judge Judy, or my cousin Vinny. Uh, when we come to this text this morning, Matthew presents to us the trial of Jesus. Now remember last week we considered how Jesus was betrayed and arrested. Today we see Jesus being led to Caiaphas, the high priest, and the other Jewish authorities, otherwise known as the Sanhedrin. Uh, during the New Testament times, the Sanhedrin, that is the supreme ecclesiastical court in Jerusalem, was made up of three kinds of members, chief priests, Elders and teachers of the law. Um, its total membership was 71, including the high priest, who was the presiding officer. Now, under Roman jurisdiction, I remind you, the Sanhedrin had a great deal of authority, but one thing they couldn't do, or one of the things they couldn't do, was impose capital punishment. They can't, couldn't do it themselves. And so what you must understand is that... Uh, as you read this text, and we see this, the beginnings of this trial unfold, there was an agenda. These leaders wanted Jesus dead. Remember, in Matthew 26, um, not long before this, we read that uh, there, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to the disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. They had an agenda. So this trial before Caiaphas was not an honest trial. It was corrupt. There was no real order in the court. The Sanhedrin and Caiaphas were no longer interested in trying to debate Jesus. When they did that in the past, he proved them wrong. When they tried to trap him, he provided answers that they could not foresee and put them to shame. After realizing that that approach wouldn't work, they had to use brute force. How could they arrest Jesus? How could they get rid of him? And how could they put him to death? So they came here, as we read in this text, to arrest him and to, to lead him to his trial. And again, we have Caiaphas questioning Jesus before the Sanhedrin. This trial, as it, it's unfolding, um, its purpose, the reality, it was not to establish the truth using proper procedures. Um, the purpose of bringing Jesus before Caiaphas was in order to establish a capital charge. And when they did that, they would hand him over to Pilate, who would then see to it that he would be crucified, put to death. So that's what we're witnessing. It was a corrupt court, not just corrupt witnesses, but the judge, the presiding officer, he as well was corrupt. Everyone involved in this trial against Jesus was working for the lie. Now, the trial was really in order to appear as if they were doing business in good order, using proper procedure. But their decision about Jesus had, listen, it already was made, right? We already knew that they wanted him 
to be put to death, and they tried in some sly way. They were plotting to kill him. How could they do this? They had their backroom meeting before the meeting, so to speak, right, uh, where they did their dirty business. They had the meeting before the meeting, and in some ways, uh, there's another account as well where Jesus was confronted by Annas. He was taken to Annas, the high priest, as well, if you read that account in John. But this was like a, they did the business, they made their conclusions prior to this trial, now they were just trying to look official, to appear as if they were actually doing things in good order. But they needed a charge. They needed a charge against our Lord in order to look like they were being judicious and impartial. Procedures, they matter. They're supposed to be used. Procedures uh, are supposed to be used during a trial in order to maximize truth so that when judgment is rendered, it's rendered impartially. Um, procedures matter. The principle is that the, the principle here underlying this is that we're after truth and then the procedure, that's the method. How do we go about establishing a just judgment, a lawful judgment, so that what will be stated in conclusion will be righteous. The methods you use during a trial will help you to determine the outcome. But these guys, again, they're way out of order in the way they were handling their business. Uh, Matthew Keener, he pointed out uh, a few things here uh, I thought were interesting, I wanted to know. Uh, later tra tra uh, rabbinic tradition suggests that there were all kinds of things out of play here, out of order in Jesus' day. Judges were supposed to, for one, conduct capital trials during daylight. This may be why a more official meeting took place around 5.30 a.m. You can read that in John's Gospel. Um, there was a second meeting, uh, as if that was the appearance of the official one. But what happened here? This was Jesus being tried by Caiaphas at night. Trials, secondly, were not supposed to occur on the eve of the Sabbath or a festival day. Thirdly, there were Pharisaic rules that required a day to pass before issuing a verdict of condemnation. But they needed a decision right away, quickly. They wanted to get their business taken care of. Uh, fourthly, the Sanhedrin was not supposed to hold trial in the high priest's palace. But we know they already had done that for their private meeting. And in Luke, in Luke's account, it says that this is where the trial took place. In Luke 22, verse 54, they led him away into the house of the high priest. There sh should have been a public place when this happened, not in a private house of, of Caiaphas, his home. Fifthly, they physically mistreated their prisoner. Whatever else happened, this was certainly illegal, what they did to Jesus. They ridiculed Jesus as a false prophet and took shots at him. And sixth, they were bringing false testimony. They were trying to establish accusation against Jesus that would condemn him. But in order to do so, what did they need? There was no way to get around. They had to have this. This was so obvious. This was necessary in order for Jesus to be condemned. They needed at least two witnesses to corrob corroborate, testify to the crime, the sin that he committed. They needed witnesses to prove that Jesus should be held accountable, and they couldn't do it. Cross-examination of witnesses was standard in Jewish law, and here minimally the examiners, what they presented, they were trying to, to, to establish some kind of two-witness case here, but uh, there were contradictions. They still had problems even doing that. In your law reading this morning, we heard from Deuteronomy, verses 15 of chapter 19, or verse 15 in chapter 19, it said this, one witness is not enough to convict a man accused of any crime or offense he may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And you know, um, when these two did stand up in our text here, finally two came forward, this was at verse 15, uh, uh, 60 and 61, and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Okay, so did they have their two witnesses at this point? Well, in Mark's account, it adds this, in Mark's gospel, then some stood up and gave this false testimony, false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple and in three days we 
uh, will build it. Uh, will build another, not made by man. And then at verse fifty nine, it says, "Yet even then, their testimony did not agree." So even this attempt here was not enough to establish this two witness necessity to convict the Lord. In the end, the witnesses could provide only a semi lined up kind of account of being able to testify to something that Jesus said as a proclamation against the type uh, of the temple, a garbled account. Uh, their recounting wasn't actually what Jesus said, in fact. If you look at what was stated here, um, and it was a misapplication of his words. So even in their attempt to be two witnesses, they didn't even quote him right. They misquoted him, which would lead people to make false con con uh, conclusions about the meaning. Jesus never said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And when Jesus spoke this, um, what he actually said in John's gospel, we have it there testified to, uh, he was referring to his body being destroyed and it being raised on the third day. That's what Jesus intended in what he had said. But ironically, check this out. Their misquotation of him was later still fulfilled when in AD 70, the Romans came and destroyed the temple, not one stone being left on another. In part it was fulfilled, but it was never rebuilt um, in the way that they tried to testify about Jesus' words. Uh, more on that in a moment, um, this judgment that ended up coming on Jerusalem and the stone temple was not rebuilt, and it hasn't been to date. So Jesus, as Lord of all, was sovereign over that judgment that was to come as well in Jerusalem. But let's look again at our text. Now, they don't have enough to convict him. Their witness about what he said regarding the temple, it wasn't enough. It didn't line up. They needed something else. Now, up to this point, Jesus did not respond to the accusations. And he, he really didn't have to, and according to the law there. Without an established uh, accusation by two witnesses, he didn't have to respond. There was no official charge. He could have responded. Oh, he could have. But he didn't at that point. Back to our text. Then the high priest stood up at verse 62 from our text this morning. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Good question. Being put under oath, Jesus responded. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. Now get this too, the claim of messiahship, that wouldn't have been enough. I'm sure they might have tried to construe this again like everything else, but it wouldn't have been enough to condemn him to death. But listen, Jesus, when put under oath, he responds truthfully, fully, and he responds with the more correct and full interpretation of his messiahship. Not only does he respond, but he provides the necessary clarification so that all would understand who he was and what he would do. He says, but I say to all of you in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Again, for us, this, this is cryptic. What, what is he talking about? I, I don't get this clouds of heaven thing. They considered, now that was the thing that they said, blasphemy! What, are you making, how you make, what's going on? Can we, how do we make the connection here? What was it that caused this res, response? How did him saying that lead to Caiaphas tearing his robes and all who were present voting to have him put to death? How is what he just said blasphemous and deserving of the death penalty? 
What Jesus did here, he took Caiaphas' words, the question, what he had said, he reformulates them, giving them a far greater meaning. And by doing so, he makes a remarkable claim. Jesus, now listen closely so you can understand, um, Jesus here combines two extremely significant texts of scriptural significance. When he responds, and these texts spoke of the Messiah and his authority. When Jesus said, in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven, he was referencing the prophetic role that would be fulfilled. Uh, from the prophet Daniel, he's referencing what Daniel had said, the prophet, in chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. And so he's taking Daniel, something that was understood um, to be messianic. Uh, he's reminding them of this, and he's combining that with Psalm 110.1. The reference to the Son of Man, one of, this was one of, I remind you, one of Jesus' favorite ways to refer to himself in messianic terms as the Son of Man. This was a prophecy from Daniel chapter 7. Remember verses 13 through 14 where it said this. You can turn if you want to read it or you can just listen. But Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 and 14. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. That is, this one was going into the holy throne room of God. He approached the Ancient of Days. That is, the Almighty Sovereign Lord. The Holy Presence. This is the throne room of God. And was led into his presence, the Son of Man. And then in verse 14, it says, He, that is the Son of Man, was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And then consider that Jesus is referring to, what, there it is there in Daniel, and how he is its fulfillment. And then he combines that along with Psalm 110.1. What's it say in Psalm 110.1? Who wants to read? Anyone? Read it if you're there, I can just read. Psalm 1101. Anyone got it? There you go. In Psalm 1101, it speaks of the one who would share God's authority and sit at his right hand ruling with him, who would also be God, Lord. The Lord said to my Lord, this is the way David speaks. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So here in the face of his accusers and enemies being asked, are you the Messiah? Jesus responds this way. His hands bound, under arrest, being slandered, being mistreated, being taken advantage of. When asked by Caiaphas, the high priest, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us. If you are the Christ, the Son of God. Oh, Jesus told him and everyone there who was listening. He answered him saying, yeah, you have said it. And let me help you understand how right you are and what it means that I'm the Messiah. Jesus said to them all. But I say to all of you in the future. Get it? In the future, you will see the Son of Man. That's me sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven in reference to the one who would be given all authority over heaven and earth, who would share the authority of Jehovah Almighty himself. In the future, a future, Jesus is going to be dead. We're preparing to hand him over to be crucified. In the future, who does he think he is? He's gonna be equal to God, ruling the world, in other words, Jesus said, because I am the Messiah, and although it appears that I am a helpless victim now, and that you are calling the shots, in fact, even death won't stop me from the throne my Father has appointed for me. That is, you will all see soon that my words will be vindicated. The tables will be turned, and you will see me for who I've always been, Lord and God, the Messiah. 
All this is in perfect keeping of my father's plan. And soon Jerusalem and your regime in Jerusalem will be destroyed in the temple. Not one stone will be left on another. And I will be Lord over both Jews and Gentiles. All authority on heaven and earth will be given to me. Now sit at my father's right hand until I've made all my enemies my footstool. This is what will happen. Sit at my right hand. This is the work of the Father through the Son, bringing to end all of those who oppose the Lord. Jesus, he wasn't intimidated, intimidated by it. There's more fulfillments here, too. Why he, did he remain silent for a time? He was like a lamb being led to the slaughter. A sheep before his shears is silent. That's what he was like at first. Remember, when the high priest stood and said, there's all these accusations, aren't you going to say anything? Jesus remained silent. This, again, was in itself another fulfillment that was at work because of what God had ordained. God was in control. The Lord Jesus was in control of what was taking place. Here was the servant promised that would come to die for the sins of his people. Jesus was in total control of this trial. Jesus only answered when he had to, when it counted, and the right question was asked. When Jesus was put under oath and his answer, the answer that he gave, think about it. This was the only truth claim of this whole trial. This was it. This was where the truth came out. When Jesus spoke, and ironically, the only true thing during this whole corrupt trial was the word himself. And again, more irony, the only true thing uttered by anyone thus far was the very claim that ended up being the one that was used against him. Um, he was handed over to death for speaking the truth. And Caiaphas said, we got him. Did you hear this? Everyone, blasphemy. Everyone, you heard it. You heard what he just said. What shall we say? Do we need to say anything more? Jesus ends up being handed over to death on a blasphemy charge. But what he said was actually true. Then the high priest, he hated the truth so much. He tore his robes, his clothes. He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. In Leviticus, it actually prohibits this kind of thing for a priest to do in Leviticus 10, verse 6, and chapter 21, verse 10. But apparently custom had required that one do so when he heard blasphemy as a sign of mourning. Uh, um, this is most unbelievable um, for us, but it's believable because God, this is God's hand in all of this. Only God could have orchestrated the unfolding of this trial. Caiaphas asked, what do you think? He turns to the Sanhedrin being present now you've heard this claim. What do you think? They said, he is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Christ. Who hit you? And he just prophesied. He just got done saying what was going to happen and who he was. They don't hear it. They didn't want the truth. Um, the hatred and disdain that our Lord faced. You see, sometimes what happens when... This is something that will occur often. The response that sinners have in the face of truth. Uh, when the truth is brought in front of the face, especially of enemies, what happens? They get all the more angry. Louder. React. They can't win a 
against the truth. So they try to kill the truth. And they can't do that either. They get more hostile. They try mocking him. And even in their mocking him, they're fulfilling the words of the prophets that were spoken about what would happen to the Messiah and how he would be rejected and handed over. And our Lord did this. He did this for his people. He went through all of this because it's what he came to do, was to save sinners from the accusations that are true against them as sinners, to provide atonement for sin, to make a way by which we can confess and repent of our mouths being silenced when the truth is spoken about us. Uh, you know, he didn't need to stay silent. He didn't need to, but he represented us, whose mouths are shut when the living God looks at our lives. We don't have a response. We're all we're a broken people. We're sinners. But Jesus went and represented us, and he took the hit so that we can have a means by which reconciliation can take place with the Father. More on that in a moment. So lastly, Peter from a distance, right? Let's make an application here. There's lots of applications that I think we can make, but um, did you see that Peter, uh, verse 58, we didn't comment on that yet. Do you remember at the beginning of the text? But Peter followed him at a distance. Again, this is leading into, we'll, we'll see more of the details of what Peter does in denying his Lord, but uh, not a great moment for Peter again. So uh, what can we learn from this? Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. He wanted to know what would happen. He's watching this uh, drama unfold from a distance. And we later know that when he was confronted, whether or not he was a disciple, he denied it. But he wanted to see it. So by way of application, let's learn that uh, we, as a people, don't want to be a mere spectator. So, Don't be a spectator only, but stand by the Lord. Let us not be mere spectators of trials, but people who stand for the truth, even if it costs us. It's, it's not enough for to simply be a disciple who watches and who looks, sees what's happening, who will only watch courtroom scenes in order to find out what happens. And in this case, this was Peter's sin. Um, he denied being a disciple of the Lord. When asked, Peter just wanted to watch this trial unfold to see what would happen. So in our weakness, uh, how is it that we tend toward a Peter-like reaction in this instance, um, under pressure? Things we might do to escape immediate trouble, even death. If that's the choice, and then in this instance, Peter took that path and what was left to him, but uh, that his spiritual reputation was in shambles because he wasn't willing to stand by the Lord. In this instance, he wasn't willing to be faithful. He compromised. He was comfortable just being a spectator disciple, one who just watched the church do what it needed to do. Or we can take that away and we can say, okay, Lord, what would you have us do? How can we learn from this instance uh, where Peter was weak, but by the Spirit of God later, Peter was renewed and and strengthened again to walk more faithfully and boldly. 
we might ask ourselves, are, are, are we going to be like the Peter in shambles or the Peter who stands by his Lord in faith? Are we the type of Christian who is willing to stand by the Lord for the sake of the truth? Again, even if it costs us, even if there are risks. Jesus said, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. And our Savior, he was no mere spectator. He stood for the truth. He is the example. He, when called to account to testify to the truth under oath, he didn't back down. He testified about his lordship, didn't go away. He didn't fail to confess the faith before men, to confess the truth in the face of those who opposed him. He didn't deny the role, role that he was called to fulfill, given to him by his father as the Messiah, as the messianic king, the servant who would come to be offered as the Passover lamb for his people. He didn't deny that. Even if it meant the cross, Jesus was willing to lose his life in order to gain it. That's the example he left for us. He took responsibility. Think about this. He wasn't at fault, was he? Was he at fault in what was happening? His disciples left him that they, they, they were that they could be faulted for their denials and for their weakness. Jesus wasn't at fault for any of this, and yet he took responsibility for his people. He stood there in, in their place to take what they deserved for their sake. He took responsibility. He was unjustly, unjustly condemned so that we wouldn't have to be. He took responsibility for our faults, our sins, our crimes, our condemnations. He was mocked, struck, spit upon. We have lots of confessions that we would need to make when it comes to our mouth speaking out of turn, things that we've said that maybe were partly true. Um, but by the grace of God, and by his spirit at work in us, as we repent of those and we trust the Lord, he strengthens us to be more consistent, to be able to stand for what's right. Consider the Apostle Paul. Sinners deserving of condemnation when being accused are silenced because of their sin, yet those who put their faith in Christ Repentance and faith in the Lord. The response of reading this morning. What did Paul say? To the faithful, Paul declared, Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. It's because of him that we don't stand condemned, right? Follow Yes. Jesus has promised that his spirit will be the faithful, uh, will be with the faithful. And so we're called to stand with him, to consider our lives, to consider how in our walk day to day. Think about this. Apply this to yourself personally as an individual, the way you think, what you believe, the way you speak. How do you interact with those who are around you? Is the goal to get truth? To stand for truth, to be loyal to the Lord, to honor his commands. We have to how what kind of procedures do you have in check for yourself and for your household and in your marriage to make sure that things are in good order? So that you're pleasing the Lord, you're not trying to bear false witness, cover look cover something up, right? We want to, to make it look like everything is good, but no, no. Go to the heart of these matters. Go to the word, to the law and to the testament, back to the word of God, so that we can keep our hearts and minds in check. That's where we find the truth. And that's what helps us live loyally, standing for that which is right. Not just merely looking as a spectator at all these things, and oh, what a nice story, but living them, 
committing our lives to God in faithfulness. So profess the Lord Jesus. Profess him publicly. Don't fear. Use wisdom. Even if it costs you. For he is the truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. So let us stand with him. So help me God. Amen. Amen. Father, we give you thanks that we have a wonderful Savior who endured so much and yet was so strong, committed, faithful. He knew that you, Father, would deliver on the promises that you gave to him and that he would be raised up in your time. And now as Lord over this world, Father, we submit to his work, his rule, and Father, we thank you for what he's doing even in our own hearts and in our minds and in our homes and in our community, Lord. Keep the devil far from us. Keep us from temptation, Lord. Strengthen us as we are called by your name. We pray these things now with faith and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's stand to sing, Hail Thou Once Despised Jesus, 285. 